crypto markets are becoming highly interconnected with the traditional financial sector. In time, DeFi could become a significant, if not the predominant, type of financial system. Welcome back to Ethereum, Audible Ethereum in depth, where I read the best in the Ethereum and Web3 ecosystem. Hope you're enjoying your week so far. It's another happy Tuesday, middle of the week. Today, we're going to be diving into a fantastic, fantastic article research paper. It's pretty long for an article. It's 36 pages written by Nick Carter and Linda Jang. They published it last year, and it is titled... DeFi Protocol Risks, the Paradox of DeFi. Uh, Nick Carter is a Bitcoiner. He's a partner at Castle Island Ventures. Uh, you can hear him on podcasts on the brink and all, often a guest appearance on a lot of other podcasts like Bankly or What Bitcoin Did. And Linda Jang is a visiting scholar on financial technology at Georgetown University's Law Center Institute of International and Economic Law. So this article, this research paper really dives into the risks in DeFi, not from a regulatory framework, but it definitely touches on that, touches on a bunch of different risks that DeFi protocols have. And I think it's really important to have those risks in mind when you're building something in in the ecosystem or considering to build something in the ecosystem or looking to invest, put your hard-earned ETH to work. And so that's what we're going to be reading today. It's probably going to take two reads because it's a monster of a paper, 36 pages long, and I'm going to keep my main take for the end of next episode. And with that, we're going to give a big shout out to Alp Audio, A-L-P-E Audio, uh, my other main project that I do when I'm not reading about crypto and Ethereum. Uh, Alp Audio is the platform for on-the-go serious learners. You can find audio courses there that cover topics like product management, creative thinking, everyday mindfulness, and they cover those topics from A to Z so that you can really learn a topic in depth on the go through audio. In the time that you have, every lesson and course comes with all of the shebangs and bells and whistles that you'd want, like summaries and flashcards and additional resources if you want to dive in further. So thanks to Alp Audio, and with that, let's go. DeFi Protocol Risks, The Paradox of DeFi by Nick Carter and Linda Jang. Abstract. Decentralized finance, or DeFi, is growing in volume and importance. DeFi promises cheaper and more open access to financial services by reducing the cost and risk of using centralized intermediaries. DeFi also holds the promise of interoperability across blockchains that could help tear down financial sector silos, greatly promoting innovation and building vibrant financial ecosystems. However, DeFi is not without its challenges, which are understudied. This article does not seek to provide a comprehensive list of DeFi, but to help readers conceptually understand the drivers behind the risks inherent in DeFi. Many of the risks described above stem from the decentralized nature of blockchains. The goal of automating the delivery of financial services and reducing human dependencies also has the congruent effect of reducing oversight and control. Disintermediating traditional intermediaries reduces high fees and entry friction, but also creates new opportunities for new types of intermediaries. This article discusses some of the new types of risks introduced by DeFi that are inherent to blockchain systems, along with traditional types of financial risks in DeFi that manifest in new ways. One, interconnections with the traditional financial system. Two, operational risks stemming from underlying blockchains. Three, smart contract-based vulnerabilities. Four, other governance and regulatory risks. And five, scalability challenges. In an effort to remove humans and automate as much as possible through smart contracts, DeFi has introduced or amplified these risks. The growth of DeFi will depend on its ability to navigate and build compatibility with traditional finance and on how laws and regulations respond. Perhaps the biggest challenge of all is that the DeFi ecosystem continues to grow while its underlying base player, public infrastructure such as Bitcoin or Ethereum, 
faces growing pains. As DeFi grows in importance and becomes more mainstream, policymakers and industry representatives need to better understand the economic and policy consequences of these new types of risks in order to build regulatory approaches and risk management practices that can support and facilitate a healthy and robust DeFi ecosystem, and ultimately, the financial stability of the greater financial system and real economy. Introduction On February 16, 2021, the price of Bitcoin crossed $50,000 for the first time, doubling its value in less than two months. Earlier in the year, a string of announcements by a number of Wall Street banks and traditional financial firms, including Bank of New York Mellon, MasterCard, and BlackRock, proclaimed that they would begin working with Bitcoin. The companies Square and Tesla made splashes by investing a combined total of nearly $2 billion in Bitcoin. Meanwhile, Square's and PayPal's retail customers now buy an amount equivalent to a majority of the new supply of Bitcoin entering the market each day. Visa also unveiled a Bitcoin and crypto plan to be launched later in 2021. Crypto is becoming mainstream and is here to stay. Decentralized finance, or DeFi, is typically understood by crypto users and enthusiasts as platforms and protocols that seek to replicate existing financial services by using crypto and blockchain technology with limited centralization. Coindesk defines DeFi as, quote, an umbrella term for a variety of financial applications in cryptocurrency or blockchain geared towards disrupting financial intermediaries. Fabian Schar defines it more specifically as, quote, an open, permissionless, and highly interoperable protocol stack built on public smart contract platforms, such as the Ethereum blockchain. Central banks and financial regulators presently do not view the crypto market as being large enough to pose a significant threat to global financial stability. However, this assessment does not discount the need for regulators, industry, and academics to understand, one, what are the new emerging risks of DeFi, and two, how DeFi may be impacting the transmission of traditional financial risks. Crypto markets are not insignificant and can no longer be discounted as small. For example, at the time of writing, DeFi projects on Ethereum hold collateral having the value of around $50 billion. As we will discuss below, crypto markets are becoming highly interconnected with the traditional financial sector. In time, DeFi could become a significant, if not the predominant, type of financial system, platformizing to varying extents the traditional financial sector. In the meantime, we need to take on the challenge of identifying and assessing the unique features of DeFi and what risks DeFi pose to the financial system. The evolution of DeFi movement to DeFi. DeFi comprises several components and continues to evolve quickly. One, through the public base layer with a digitally native token. Two, software protocols that codify agreed rules. Three, smart contracts that implement financial logic, for example, executing the transactions once specific conditions are met. And four, stable coins backed by reserves held at banks. In this chapter, we look at the various components of the DeFi universe with a particular focus on software protocols. DeFi protocols are automated systems deployed on public blockchains, typically Ethereum, whereby users can take advantage of liquidity supplied by many counterparties in order to engage in asset swaps or acquire leverage without dealing with a centralized financial counterparty. After a call for crypto regulation by France and Germany, the G20 ministers of finance and central bank governors instructed the Financial Stability Board to assess its work and the work of standard-setting bodies on crypto assets. The FSB concluded that crypto assets did not pose a material threat to global financial stability at the time of assessment, but that crypto assets would require vigilant monitoring. However, the FSB's approach focused on potential transmissions of risk to traditional financial sectors. We argue that as DeFi becomes mainstream, regulators and industry will need to quickly get up to speed on how DeFi operates and what are its inherent risks for users and the real economy. After the introduction in Section 1, Section 2 provides historical background on the evolution of DeFi. The main body of this chapter, Section 3, identifies and attempts to categorize DeFi risks into five main buckets. 
As we explore these crypto-centric risks, we keep in mind how these new risks compare to the traditional credit, liquidity, counterparty, market, and operational risks, and how our understanding of these traditional risks could be applied to DeFi. How these traditional financial risks manifest themselves in DeFi may differ somewhat from traditional financial sectors. Section 4 concludes and provides a preliminary analysis of what these crypto-based risks and vulnerabilities could mean to the global financial system. Definitions DeFi blockchain projects include decentralized exchanges, or DEXs, lending platforms where central intermediaries are not needed to hold funds and transactions occur on a peer-to-peer -peer basis through automated processes, and decentralized applications, or DAPs. One definition of DeFi is, quote, the movement that leverages decentralized networks to transform old financial products into trustless and transparent protocols that run without intermediaries, end quote. Another defines DeFi to mean where it, quote, expands the use of blockchain from simple value transfer to more complex financial use cases. And as mentioned earlier, another more specific definition is, quote, an open permissionless and highly interoperable protocol stack built on public smart contract platforms, such as the Ethereum blockchain. Many argue that DeFi is a form of finance that uses blockchain and does not rely on traditional central intermediaries, such as banks, stock exchanges, or broker dealers. DeFi has been rapidly evolving since the introduction of first-generation Bitcoin to the emergence of second-generation stablecoins and the use of initial coin offerings to fundraise. These DeFi projects, in theory, can become active ecosystems, even alternatives to traditional financial systems, by leveraging smart contracts and decentralized asset custody to replace costly traditional intermediaries. Most DeFi projects are built on Ethereum, and many credit Ethereum's easy-to-program platform for enabling the explosion in DeFi projects. As of March 2021, 87% of 5,727 ICO-funded DeFi projects have been built on Ethereum. Researchers Chen and Bella Vidis have identified four main categories of DeFi projects. Decentralized exchanges, decentralized lending and borrowing, programmable decentralized derivatives, and automated financial processes. Each of these categories possesses a set of risks, but they share some common features. They all leverage decentralized infrastructure and smart contracts. Smart contracts, however, are not legal contracts. They are software protocols that live on chain to automatically implement a procedure legal contract, or business practice. Why use smart contracts? Why use DeFi at all? The benefits of automated delivery of financial services by smart contracts are attractive. The transparency offered by blockchain technology provides efficient auditing of solvency and proof of reserve. Decentralization and the process of unbundling financial services can remove expensive traditional intermediaries, making finance more equitable. The use of smart contracts can also reduce execution risk. DeFi could allow for more open and cheaper access to financial services, reducing costs and risks from using centralized intermediaries. DeFi also holds the promise of interoperability across blockchains. This borderlessness of DeFi can help tear down financial sector silos, greatly promoting innovation and building vibrant financial ecosystems. DeFi is not without its challenges, though. It introduces new types of risks, discussed below in Section 3. The promise of interoperability offered by DeFi has led to a concentration of nearly all DeFi projects on the blockchain Ethereum, a new form of concentration risk. Ironically, in the mission to remove humans and automate as much as possible, other risks have been either introduced or amplified, including the challenge to maintain code security. The growth of DeFi will also depend on its ability to navigate and build compatibility with traditional finance. It will also depend on how national and state laws and regulations evolve. Perhaps the biggest challenge of all is that the DeFi ecosystem continues to grow while its underlying base layer, public infrastructure such as Bitcoin or Ethereum, faces growing pains manifesting in high fees. Risk Factors in DeFi the DeFi system is predicated on the notion of extreme transparency, in which anyone can effectively see everyone else's transactions. 
although larger entities have found ways to be anonymous by using popular analytical tools, such as pseudonymity and privacy-enhancing features. Extreme transparency offers tremendous potential for disintermediating traditional financial intermediaries and automating delivery of financial services. But extreme transparency also provides ample opportunities for exploitation. At its core, DeFi depends on shared public databases with public read access and unfettered write access, provided the entity adding an entry into the blockchain pays a sufficient fee. Anyone with knowledge of these systems, an internet connection, and sufficient tokens to pay for fees can deploy a smart contract that any other user can subsequently engage with in a permissionless manner. Smart contracts are software protocols that live on-chain. They are publicly available for anyone to engage with, audit, or scrutinize. This open access to smart contracts vastly increases the scope for financial innovation, as developers, for instance, are not limited by financial institutions requiring permission to engage with their APIs. Inevitably, this also introduces new forms of risk, as there are no required professional or licensing qualifications restricting who can deploy, manage, or engage with smart contracts. A general objective shared by DeFi practitioners is stripping human discretion from financial contracts and encoding the rules for behavior into highly automated, publicly available systems. In practice, however, human discretion remains. DeFi systems must be deployed, governed, and upgraded, and face occasional bugs or exploitative interactions with other protocols. They also run on public blockchains, which face similar issues and occasionally require human intervention too. As such, the core DeFi protocols tend to retain some level of human involvement from controlling entities. This is a means to mitigate risks when they emerge, but it also poses a potential threat to these systems if the administrators themselves are compromised, malicious, or somehow co-opted. Some risk factors and exploits are analogous to those evident in existing financial products, like market risk, the manipulation of an underlying price to interfere with a derivative, one of the most frequent forms of attacks against DeFi protocols, and front-running transactions through fee-upping and quant models. Others are completely novel and idiosyncratic to the asset class, like protocol-level reorganizations to invalidate prior transactions, validators reordering transactions to extract value from on-chain marketplaces, or flash loans, giving attackers unlimited free leverage. We divide our discussion of DeFi risk factors into five general buckets. One, interconnections with a traditional financial system. Two, operational risks stemming from underlying blockchains. Three, smart contract-based vulnerabilities. Four, other governance and regulatory risks. And five, scalability challenges. The list of risks identified in this chapter is by no means exhaustive, but we attempt to outline the primary challenges. 1. Interconnections with traditional financial system. Banks holding reserves backing stablecoins. While DeFi aspires to create a parallel and independent financial system based on code rather than legal enforcement, key components of the DeFi system rely in practice on traditional financial market infrastructure. The most critical nexus between the two systems can be found in stablecoins. These consist of dollar-denominated tokens circulated on public blockchains, and in principle are backed by commercial bank dollars immobilized at financial institutions. Stablecoins are useful for transactions in DeFi as they introduce fiat-denominated collateral into the open transactional context of public blockchains. However, the vast majority of stablecoins derive their value from underlying dollar instruments, and thus introduce a dependency on an issuer of the underlying instruments and the financial institution where the dollars are parked. At the time of writing, at least $65 billion worth of stablecoins circulate on public blockchains, but only around $3.1 billion consists of non-redeemable stablecoins issued against crypto-native collateral. The remainder is fully dependent on an ongoing bank relationship and the promise of redeemability for the underlying instruments to be upheld. Even some of the most purportedly decentralized stablecoins have introduced points of compromise, the MakerDAO system is a set of tools for users to issue dollar-denominated tokens named DAI, which is soft-pegged to the US dollar, in an automated way against an over-collateralized basket of other assets. 
Issuing dollar-denominated assets against crypto collateral within a smart contract is intended to insulate the token from the traditional financial system and potential points of compromise. Market Risks in Stablecoins' Underlying Reserves In November 2019, MakerDAO introduced non-native forms of collateral, backing an upgraded form of DAI, dubbed Multi-Collateral DAI, to manage market volatility of Ether. Initially, all DAI were issued in an over-collateralized manner against the digital native cryptocurrency Ether. Collateralizing against Ether made the MakerDAO system more insulated from third-party liabilities, less interdependent with traditional finance, and thus arguably more robust and resilient. Since Ether is no one's liability and its value is solely market-determined, it is arguably more suitable to back assets like DAI as long as its downside volatility is managed. However, in November 2019, MakerDAO began to permit users to broaden the portfolio of crypto assets backing DAI in order to obtain a less volatile collateral, including the USD coin USDC, Tether USDT, Wrapped Bitcoin WBTC, and Basic Attention Token BAT. This collateral diversification introduced new risks. These new collateral types were not liability free like Ether, but in some cases, the liability of a single issuer. As of the time of writing, 1.6 billion worth, or 16% of the 6.5 billion collateral in MakerDAO system represents the liability of a third party. All of the assets in question can be frozen by entities administering these stablecoin systems, obviating the trustlessness of a portion of the MakerDAO system. For example, if the USDC governing consortium center were to freeze the 332 million worth of USDC held in the MakerDAO reserve, MakerDAO's ability to maintain the dollar peg of DAI could be compromised. Furthermore, while Center's USDC has largely coexisted with DeFi, this status quo could be tested should a regulator apply pressure to Center, or the regulated financial institutions issuing USDC. Center's blacklisting policy indicates that they would blacklist blockchain addresses in order to comply with the law, regulation, or legal order from a duly recognized U.S. Author authorized authority, U.S. court of competent jurisdiction, or other government authority with jurisdiction over Center. Additionally, the bank's holdings reserves backing USDC could withdraw their support for the token issuer, as happened repeatedly with the stablecoin Tether. So the presence of liability-laden collateral in purportedly purely crypto-economic systems like Make or Die injects the potential for interference through regulatory oversight, commercial bank policy, or direct action from the stablecoin issuer itself. Sources of Market Illiquidity As for the standard fiat-backed stablecoins, they now account for a significant share of liquidity for the major DeFi protocols. The top five DeFi protocols by USD equivalent amount of collateral supplies, MakerDAO, Curve, Uniswap, Aave, and Compound collectively host $3.8 billion in USDC and $1.06 billion in USDT, Tether, in deposits. These figures represent 42% of outstanding USDC and 5.2% of outstanding Tether circulating on Ethereum. These two stablecoins represent critical sources of liquidity for those various DeFi protocols. USDC represents 19.5% of collateral on the lending protocol compound, and the USDC ETH pair is the second most liquid pair on the decentralized exchange Uniswap. These stablecoins are naturally exposed to the failure of banks holding collateral reserves backing these two stablecoins. Historically, banking support for certain stablecoin issuers can be questionable as evidenced by the disclosures found in a settlement agreement between Tether and the New York Attorney General's office. A bank insolvency, regulatory action, or issuer failure, likely causing the stablecoins in question to trade at a discount to par, as happened historically during confidence crises, would impair the collateral and liquidity that powers these DeFi systems. High Interconnectedness – Banking Relationships with Crypto Trading Firms Aside from stablecoin banking, a handful of banks providing critical services to cryptocurrency firms. Historically, only a small number of U.S. banks, including Silvergate Bank, Signature Bank, and Metropolitan Community Bank, 
have actively pursued clients in the DeFi space. These banks represent critical points of centralization for the crypto industry. A disruption or an insolvency among any one of these banks would adversely affect whole swaths of the cryptocurrency industry. Perhaps the bank with greatest concentration of the crypto industry, Silvergate Bank, is a California state chartered bank based in San Diego that turned its focus to the cryptocurrency industry in 2013 and now provides banking services to firms active in the space. Their flagship product is the Silvergate Exchange Network, which enables real-time USD transfers between its clients, which are largely centralized crypto exchanges and institutional investors. Acquiring banking services has been so challenging for crypto exchanges and firms that Silvergate has become a key nexus connecting traditional banking and the digital currency industry. As of Q4 2020, Silvergate boasted $5.5 billion in assets on their balance sheet and $5.3 billion in cryptocurrency deposits. Their SCN transfer network processed $59.2 billion in intra-bank transfer volume in the fourth quarter, providing an alternative settlement means for crypto firms looking to settle the USD fiat leg of crypto fiat trades. While a small number of more mature crypto firms are able to obtain banking relationships with the largest banks in the US, most firms active in the virtual currency industry rely on Silvergate and its peers, which are relatively small community banks, to settle the USD fiat leg of crypto fiat trades and for banking services. Any instability or secession of banking in this cohort could cripple the crypto industry, as crypto exchanges, brokerages, and OTC desks would have to scramble to find alternative sources of USD fiat liquidity. More recently, Facebook-backed Diem announced that Silvergate will be the exclusive issuer of the Diem USD stablecoin in a sudden about-face from a cross-border payment strategy to a US-centric approach. This partnership with Facebook's Diem only further augments the US's crypto industry exposure to Silvergate. Retail Exposure consumer fintech apps. DeFi has begun to cross the threshold to mainstream consumer fintech apps, thus moving beyond an audience of high-tech early adopters. A number of retail crypto exchanges have begun serving as interfaces for DeFi protocols, effectively reducing the frictions involved in getting access to DeFi and exposing retail users to their benefits and risks. Now, there are publicly traded firms that depend on the functionality of smart contracts and may well have user funds deposited with them. Consumer fintech apps now make crypto highly accessible to retail investors who may not fully understand what they're trading. The popular retail-facing brokerage Coinbase, which boasts 56 million verified users as of their Q1 2021 quarterly filing, has begun to embrace DeFi, positioning themselves, among other things, as an interface to these blockchain protocols. For instance, Coinbase details their growing proximity to and engagement with the decentralized interest rate swap protocol Compound in its form S1. Quote, Our relationship with Compound began in 2018 when Coinbase Ventures invested in Compound Labs, the DeFi pioneer behind the Compound protocol. Coinbase was also an early adopter of Compound supplying USDC liquidity to the protocol in 2019 and allowing Coinbase wallet users to access Compound directly starting in early 2020. End quote. A number of other cryptocurrency brokers, custodians, and lenders have begun to see themselves as interfaces to DeFi protocols, in addition to their core businesses. Binance, one of the largest spot and derivative exchanges for cryptocurrencies, has reported a 24-hour trading volume of $80 billion on January 4, 2021, and has over 350,000 BTC and 3.6 million ETH held on deposit on behalf of clients. This large cryptocurrency exchange has now openly embraced DeFi, providing not only a centralized brokerage and exchange experience, but a number of pass-through products enabling users to participate in decentralized protocols through its Binance Earn suite. Additionally, the Swiss fintech firm Taurus Group has integrated the lending and borrowing Aave protocol into its infrastructure, permitting institutional clients to access liquidity on the DeFi protocol. This presages a possible scenario where fintechs or financial institutions start to put client assets in DeFi protocols in order to take advantage of attractive interest rates, 
which are generally higher than returns on cash held at banks, although they offer fundamentally different risk profiles. Corporate Exposure – Corporate Treasuries Lastly, some corporations are obtaining direct exposure to native cryptocurrencies on their balance sheet, either as an alter alternative treasury asset, as with MicroStrategy, Square, or Tesla, or in preparation to actually use the token to transact on the protocol directly. This presages more engagement from public corporations with these shared infrastructures. The Chinese smartphone firm Meitu acquired 15,000 ETH, citing its potential utility in future transactions on the Ethereum network. Quote, the Ether purchased would become the gas reserve for the group's potential de apps to consume in the future, as well as being used as consideration for investing in blockchain-based projects that take Ether as consideration. End quote. Meitu indicated in their disclosure that they were considering launching Ethereum-based dApps and would thus require a reserve of Ether in order to transact on the Ethereum network. While interactions between traditional firms and DeFi systems have been historically sparse, growing evidence suggests that integration is taking place. The earliest adopters were crypto exchanges exchanging crypto assets with traditional assets and providing pass-through services to DeFi protocols. More interactions are emerging between banks servicing crypto businesses, transacting on these networks directly, and increasingly with other firms looking to benefit from the assurances of public blockchains. More recently, Visa announced their intention to engage with DeFi directly, enabling the settlement of transactions with USDC on the Ethereum network. As DeFi comes to offer more modes of transactions, firms like Meitu may come to have an interest in using these DeFi networks directly. Such corporate firms will need to assess their risk exposure to a protocol smart contract and underlying cryptocurrency and blockchain. They will also need to assess how they may even pass these risks on to their customers and business partners. All right, and that closes the section of the research paper on the interconnectedness between the traditional financial system, the TradFi, and the decentralized financial system, DeFi, and the risks that connect them to, whether it's illiquidity risks or underlying market risks. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to call it a day for today. And next read, we're going to be continuing with the different risk factors that come from the underlying blockchains, uh, as well as the other risk factors that Nick Carter and Linda Jeng put down in this research paper. It's a long one, but it's really thorough and important to get a good wrap on. So we're going to cut it here for today and pick up next week.